I was pregnant at the age of 23. Randy had adopted me. There was a dad out there somewhere. You know, I had grown up in a mainstream church and uh, the, the grace of God was not prevalent, for sure. The first light that shone in my heart actually was at the age of 21, at the death of a friend at his funeral service. Yeah, I like to think that he died that I might live. Blessed is Joseph, the man who was set apart from his brothers. Cavell, we just wanted to start with your story because obviously it's so important to what BJ is going to share. So, you know, why first off do you feel it's important to share your part of this story as well? God has blessed us with a tremendous ending and it's important to share that. Is it tough to be here today to share your side of the story? No, not today. I'm excited to share it. Hi, I'm Cavell Elward. Most of you know me as BJ's mom, and I'm here to share a little bit of my story and encourage my boy in sharing his. Hi, my name is BJ Estes, and I'm excited to tell you a little bit of my story. I was pregnant at the age of 23, and uh, at that point in life, I was well steeped in uh, alcohol and drugs and sex. Uh, addictions that followed me for a lot of years. There was a time in my life where I, I could not go very long without having a sexual partner. And so we had done two or three pregnancy tests, uh, negative, positive, couldn't be determined. I was scheduled to have a DNC actually, and uh, which would have aborted this boy. And on the morning that I was to go, I canceled. And I consider that to be the hand of God. Shortly after that, the pregnancy was confirmed, uh, and I was very excited to be pregnant. Uh, in, in that, I felt uh, I would have someone to love, and someone to love me. You know, I'd had many uh, sexual partners, and uh, had no idea who the biological father might be. And at that point in my life, I did not feel that. Uh, it was something that I needed to know. And I, I sad for B, I guess, that, you know, I, I didn't feel that he needed to know that I had enough love for us and that that would be good. When I realized I was pregnant, for some reason, and again, I, I consider this to be God's hand, I wrote down the names of the potential biological fathers. And there was four of them. And that was uh, in the event that uh, I might not be around when BJ wanted to look, or a uh, memory lapse, you know? Uh, yeah, we had those. So the first three months of BJ's conception, actually, I was still using. I did not know I was pregnant. Yeah. And uh, I, I can remember well uh, my head in the toilet. So I, I took myself to AA, actually, at that point, and uh, remained there until BJ was born. In program, I met Randy Estes. BJ was three months old when I met Randy. I was pregnant shortly thereafter. 
<laughs> with my sister. With, oh. <laughs> with Rebecca, uh, who uh, BJ and, and Bex share uh, the same age for two weeks every year, what we call Irish twins. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Randy and I married. Uh, both BJ and Rebecca were at the wedding, and Randy adopted BJ. Mm -hmm. BJ grew with the knowledge that... Uh, Randy had adopted me. Yes, and that I did not know his biological father. Right. There was a dad out there somewhere. <laughs> and uh, as he grew, we discussed that on several occasions. And uh, I always said to him that if he got to the point of wanting to look, I, I would do my best to help him. Does he become a, a real father figure? Well, that, that's a, another story, I believe. You know, there was, was a, a lot of addictions in both of our lives. Sadly, Randy died in his. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think life was pretty tough for my children, actually. Yeah, there's no sugarcoating addictions, you know? Uh, no sugarcoating all of the men that came into my life and became a part of my children's lives and, and then was not there anymore. Lots of after the bar parties, lots of mama not making it home. Yeah, being uh, kicked and, yeah, bleeding and puking and spending the night in drunk tanks and uh, social services being involved. Uh, so what is that like for a child? I would think that's pretty darn scary. When the bar closed, everyone would come to our house because everyone's got to keep drinking past two in the morning. And so we would literally wake up in the middle of the night to music and walk out of our bedroom and there's 40 people in our living room that are completely wasted and walk out the door and mom's getting drop kicked in the face and blood everywhere. And one night we came out and mom was marching around the house with an AK-47, you know, waiting for her boyfriend to come home because she wanted to shoot him. When I tell it, it's like, a, for me, it's like a funny story, but it's not. You know, like, it's, it's not funny, but it's, like, so crazy that it's, like, holy. Like, I lived through that, you know? And for my mom, and I don't judge it, it's like she was in her sickness of addiction. And it, so it's not like that's not who, she's not defined by that moment. So to tell it, it's kind of like, remember how crazy you were? Like, you know, like how you tell stories like that? It, it's more like that. You just have to be numb to it. I woke up one night, the house was destroyed. The fridge was tipped over, food was everywhere. Uh, Mom wasn't there, but the boyfriend was there destroying the house and I walked in the room and I remember he threw a jacket at me and I just remember running. It was pouring rain like, like Terrace BC pouring rain, like you can't imagine, like just buckets. And I ran like probably five or six blocks to someone's house that lived close by. Uh, and I just remember running thinking I just left my brother in that house and crying and running and I can't even imagine, like just PJ pants, no shirt, no shoes, no socks. And I just, that for me like stands out as a really like hopeless, helpless moment. I can't believe I just left my brother there. Is he gonna be okay? Like that kind of stuff. Mom was a go to the bar party alcoholic dad was a disappear in his basement for three months alcoholic so they're very different mom's was like crazy lifestyle dad's was complete absent father for months at a time like you love me but you're gone so how do you love me like those kind of confusing feelings like because we felt very loved by him and then when we were with him it was like oh we're dad's back we got our group going again let's go to the lake every weekend and you know what i mean so confusing Randy died in 2003, six months prior to the loss of our boy. Jake and drowned in the Nanaimo River. He had come to work with his brother for the summer. Losing a child is a tremendous 
tremendous pain. I was seven years clean when Jacob died, and uh, mm. I, I would often share that, uh, you know, if you had told me that I would not use through the loss of a child, I, I would have said you were nuts, right? Yeah. Because I, I could not conceive that. Yeah. Using is a painkiller, right? And there was a lot of pain. Uh, when Jacob died, I was definitely at a very strong point of walking with God. I, I see it now as preparation. So yeah, two losses in that year. Uh, very hard on BJ and Beck, I think. And not I think, I know. First their dad and then their brother. It took me uh, 15 years of trying to clean up. My clean date is uh, 96. I began in 81, right when I was carrying my boy. My dad, Randy Estes, who raised me, you know, with my mom, you know, she was a single mom. He was in our lives and out of our lives, in and out of his addiction. Uh, he loved me well. I never felt like an adopted kid. I was his son, and that was never in question. I, I felt like his son, you know, but I knew that I had been adopted. My mom told me at a young age, you know, there's been seasons in my life when it was a burning curiosity. It was a burning passion to know who my f biological father was. And then there's been seasons when it was just a subtle curiosity. One of the things that always poked me on this was people would say to me, oh, Estes, that's a neat last name. Like, what is that? What ethnicity is that? And that's something that always reminded me that I don't know because Estes is Randy's ethnicity, but he's not my blood father. So when people would ask me that, I would think, well, it really doesn't matter what Estes is because it's not my ethnicity. So when I first did Ancestry.ca, which is how this all came to be, I was just doing it to find out what my ethnicity was. I had been showing a client a house and she had mentioned that her friend had just done this and they had found out they're this percentage. I was like, oh, it's that easy? So I did the little spit test, sent it in, and a couple weeks later I had the results. At the bottom of the page, it said, hey, click here for a thousand cousins or closer. So I was like, oh, cool, click the button. And I didn't know how that program worked at the time, but it basically spits out your closest connection to your furthest. And I didn't know that. So my mom having, you know, 16 brothers and sisters, or being 16 of them, um, it's been a very common conversation to, be, to say like, who's this? Doug guy, oh, that's Auntie Anne's cousin on the fourth side, or like, you know what I mean? So this name popped up on the top of my list, Jason Labossier. And I was like, oh, I wonder who that is. I wonder who's cousin or uncle or whatever. So I called mom, hey, I got my ancestry. And I said, hey, uh, this name popped up, Jason Labossier, who's, who is that? And she said, how do you know that name? And I was like, well, it's on my ancestry. And she said, well, one of the guys that could be your dad is Ron Labossier. So I said, well, I think we know who dad is. So I searched Jason Labossier and sure enough, this guy pops up that's like my twin. I was like, holy, that is definitely my half brother. So that's what he was showing up as first cousin or closer, half brother or closer. So. First thing that popped into my mind was, how do I know this guy didn't cheat on his wife with my mom? So if I message Jason directly, I could be telling this guy, hey, you have a brother, <laughs> and his dad might have cheated on his mom 40 years ago and no one knew. So I instantly was like, I cannot selfishly just nuke this family if this is the case. So I had their home phone number, so my friend tried reaching out for months. They were 
snowbirding down south. This guy kept calling. They thought it was a prank call. They thought it was, uh, you know, like there's so much fraud going around. He wasn't calling and saying, hey, you have a son. He was calling. I have something really important I need to talk to you about because we didn't want to just do that. So this went on for months. Here's me knowing who my family is, seeing them on Facebook, seeing their wives and their kids. And like, I know who my whole family is, but I can't touch them or contact them. So I did this for months to the point where I felt like I had done my due diligence to satisfy that I had tried. And I selfishly, I kind of just snapped and said, no, I'm just gonna reach out to Jason. Hey, there's some pretty important news here. You might wanna log on and check it out. That was my message, basically. I looked for the next couple days. Finally, about five days later, I can now see that he's logged on. So I'm like, okay, so now he knows. Funny enough, he's told me, like he logged on, saw a first cousin or closer and thought, oh, I got another, he didn't know how the program worked either. He's like, oh, I got another cousin, big deal. So I log on five days later, I can see that he's seen my message. So I'm like, well, I'm just going all in. Hi, Jay, here's the situation. <laughs> my mom and your dad were together October of 1980 at this hotel in Fort McMurray. This is what happened, this is when it happened. So I said, I'm not after anything except to know living relatives. The next morning I'm sitting at breakfast, uh, eating breakfast, checking my Facebook, and all of a sudden a friend request pops up, Jason Labossier. So I'm just sitting there and I'm like, holy cow. Do I slow play this? Like, do I wait a day or two to, I'm like, no, I just click accept. And literally I clicked accept and all of a sudden the three little bubbles pop up. And his first message to me is, man, dot, 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 dot. <laughs> so he's like, today's my son's birthday. I really want to talk to you, but we let's, today's a, you know, a busy day. So can we chat tomorrow morning at 10 a.m.? So I'm like, yeah, absolutely, let's do it, right? So the next morning, 8 a.m., he's like, hey, are you available now? <laughs> so he calls me, we start chatting. And when I get on my phone, and I, this might be a realtor thing, I don't know, but you just kind of start wandering when you're talking. And I was in my PJs, like pajama pants, and I walked around like three blocks talking to him on the phone, like without even really thinking about it. And we talked for like an hour, hour and a half maybe, and my friend Adam texts me and goes, dude, I just drove to Tim Hortons and I think I saw you walking in your PJs on the street. <laughs> so he had seen me. They had no idea I existed. It was a one night stand 40 years ago. Like how would he know that she had had a kid and I was his, right? Jay said, I gotta talk to Joe. So Jay is the younger brother, Joe's the older brother. I'm the oldest. They didn't know if dad had cheated on, not that he was a cheater, but they didn't know. Like we, they didn't know the exact timeline. So Joe, he called Judy and said, hey Judy, we're having, hey mom, we're having a, we're trying to figure out who dated the longest before getting married. He was trying to figure out exactly when they had, because the timelines were so close. So I was conceived October of 1980. Dad and Judy got together May of 1981. So they got together before I was even born. That's why the timelines were so close. So that was very important in how we moved forward with this. And everyone just wanted to be careful, right? I mean, it's 40 years ago. Like, people are different 40 years ago. A lot's happened in 40 years, you know? So this all happened in a morning. Jay's like, I have to tell Joe. This is like 10 a.m. 11 a.m. I get. Dad's heading over. We're going to tell Dad. <laughs> 12 a.m. I get a text. Dad knows we're heading upstairs to tell Mom. <laughs> so this all happens, like, right away. But Joe is, Jay is the fireman, wears heart on his sleeve, played hockey his whole life, like he's an instant bro, you know? And we're both on Ancestry, so we both see the genetic connection and we're like all in. Ron has a brother named Roland. Ron is my dad, has a brother named Roland. Jay tells Joe about me. Joe is the doctor, he's a urologist, did 17 years of school, he's the brains of the family. His response is, there's room for error with genetics. We need to get a legal paternity test done. How do we know he's not Uncle Roland's son and maybe he's our cousin actually? Like I'm not saying he's not family, but we need to make sure that he's actually a brother before we go down this rabbit hole of 
building relationship, which I think is brilliant wisdom. And I'm thankful for that. It sucked because it took more weeks. So Joe, Ron and Judy, none of them wanted to make any contact with me until we had the test done. So I ordered the test that day, took a week to come. I had to go to a clinic in Nanaimo. Dad had to go to a clinic in Edmonton. Then we had to wait another week or two. So honestly, the only time that I was emotional in this whole process, like, like where I was like undone, was opening that test when it came in the mail. And just, I was by myself. My wife wasn't home yet. I remember opening it and it was just like, it was like 39 years of wondering, even though I kind of knew now, it was still not definitive. And then Joe had kind of cast this like, it could not be. So then I was kind of living in it could not be land. Even though in my heart I knew, like I looked at the photos and I knew, and I think Jay felt the same way. Like we were talking, me and Jay were talking through these weeks, which was amazing for me to have that. Cause I, I felt like I knew, he felt like he knew, but the re we needed to honor the process with the family. But when I open that paper that just spits out chromosome, 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 and then at the bottom, it's like, it's like, this is who you are on paper, you know? And this is who your dad is. And you're like a 99.9% .9 match. And it was just like definitive. So that happened in, I think the next morning, my dad called me and it was just like, yeah, it was just wild. I remember he said, he called me Bernard. He still calls me Bernard. I'm like, it's BJ. He's like, calls me Bernard, but I love it. It's like his thing. He calls me Bernard. So, um, and son, he calls me son right away, which is pretty wild. Yeah. It was just like, wow. Like, Hey, we were just a bunch of kids that made some decisions. And he said at the end of the day, if, if you're my son, you're my son and I'm excited to meet you. And how do we go about this? And when can we do this? And it was those kind of conversations. So, you know, I had met with a friend who was a therapist and we had talked about all the different ways that people in this family could respond. Some could be angry, some could be guarded, some could be like all the different ways. <laughs> we never talked about, they're all gonna be all in. <laughs> it was such a blessing to like, and I think the hand of God, like softening hearts for them to be like in, you know? I want to share how BJ got his name, actually. Mm. Uh, when I was pregnant with BJ, uh, my father came to me and asked if I might call my child after him if I had a boy. And uh, my relationship with my father was such that I gave him a hard time and, and said, like, who in their right mind would name a baby Bernard? <laughs> But I was tremendously honored, actually, because I, I loved him deeply. And uh, my mother's name was Josephine. So I came to the decision that I would call my child BJ, male or female, after my parents. He would either be Bernard Joseph or Bernadette Josephine. And that's where BJ came from. Judy was a bit, um, and fully understandably, um, she was a bit guarded in, in it. And uh, we had made plans to go. And then Joe and Jay called me. Out of the whole thing, I was trying to protect Judy from day one. Like, I didn't know if he had cheated. Like, all the things were, I don't want to nuke this woman's family. Like, that was my heart. Like, right from the beginning when I found out, you know? So... <laughs> Funny, I wrote Judy a really like long letter, just like laying out my heart. And uh, so one of the things I said in there was like, hey, j like just so you know, like the way that I view marriage is a husband and wife become one. And so it's not like I want Ron and Jay and Joe, but I don't want you. So, <laughs> let me gather myself for a second. 
So I wrote her this letter and basically said like, I view marriage like the two become one. And so I want like a relationship with you as much as I would want a relationship with Ron. And if I had met you 20 years ago, like you would have been in, just as involved in my life, you know? I had sent the letter the night before, Jay and Joe call and they're like, Beach, um, you know, Judy's having a bit of a hard time with this. We're wondering if maybe we should just delay meeting a little bit just to give her some time to wrap her head around this and da da da. And I didn't know that yet, right? So they were just telling me this and I was like, uh, <laughs> I gotta tell you guys, I sent her like a really big letter last night. <laughs> so they didn't know that. They hadn't chatted with her yet. Um, <laughs> and then literally like that day, it's like, okay, Judy's good. <laughs> I just sent it through Facebook. Um, just kind of laying out everything, you know? So I was Bernard Joseph, he's Ron, Ronald Joseph. He named his firstborn son, Joseph. But I was actually his firstborn son, right? So she was having a hard time understanding how this Bernard Joseph, how Ron didn't know anything about this son that's like named after him. Like that's her way of viewing it, right? So in my letter to her, I had actually unpacked how I got my name. I was unknowingly disarming all of her reservations. Like it was such a God thing. Cause, cause for me, she was the gatekeeper to this, working or not working. Cause I, I knew like, imagine being raised with a mom, like Jay and Joe, that's their mom for 30, five and 38 years. And now this guy comes in that's like threatening her motherness in a sense, you know? Like I would want to protect that too. So I knew that that relationship was important. This was the verse that was given to BJ shortly after Randy and I married. I, I think it's important that people know that uh, God had moved in our lives in, in mighty ways, you know, in spite of our backsliding. Since Bernard was not a name in the Bible, but was a, a, an important part of our lives, uh, Joseph became his scripture verse. And Joseph being Jacob's son, of course, and Jacob's blessing for his boy. So uh, Genesis 49, 22 to 26, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Even by the God of thy father who shall help thee and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts and blessings of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors, which is my ancestors, unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brother. We drove to meet them on Ruth's birthday, May 23rd. And so what's that like, right? Like meeting them for the first time? It was amazing. Arms wide open, big hugs at the door. Um, we walked in, Judy was cooking in the kitchen. Lyric instantly beelined to her and uh, just jumped in and started cooking and they cooked the whole meal together. And it was like, dad just says it was like love at first sight for Judy. That was like instant grandchild, you know? So that was pretty cool. <laughs> it was such a magical experience, I think for everybody, like for me, like to have this, and you know, they're, they were very aware of like, I've known about this my whole life. They've known about it for two months. So they were very aware that this was way bigger for me. 
because they, they have a great family. They're, they have an awesome family, and I think they know that I'm coming into a really cool family. I know that I have a really cool family, so I'm, I went there with confidence in that, you know? Confidence in that, um, you know, I think it's gonna be apparent really quick that I'm not looking for anything hidden. There's no hidden agenda. I do wanna say this, like, I grew up with a mom and a dad and a brother and a sister. Like, I had a full family. And when my brother died and my dad passed away, um, me and my mom and sister have been close. We, I wasn't looking for this because they weren't enough. Me and my sister to this day, my mom touched on it, we're, we're, we're Irish twins for a few weeks of the year. Like, we're close. Like, we camp together, we talk together, we go for walks, coffees. Like, we, we're close. Um, and she's excited to get to know these guys too. Like, they're BJ's, they're my big bros bros, you know? Me and mom were talking about the Joseph scripture this morning, how dad had given me that scripture as a kid, you know? And because he had given me that scripture, I've referenced Joseph a lot in my life. The redemption in this for me is because of my childhood and the craziness and the difficulty and the brokenness and all the things, I've always read Joseph's story from the perspective of thrown in the pit, thrown in prison at Potiphar's life. Like he, his brothers sold him to slavery when he was 17 years old. And he didn't become the ruler of Pharaoh's household until he was like 30. So you have this guy who lost his brother, who lost his dad, who lost everything. I've always read Joseph's story from that perspective. And it's only this year that I now read the Joseph story of restored to his brothers, restored to his dad. Wow. To now understand that story from the other side of the redemptive side of Joseph. The last line in the scripture is, blessed is Joseph, the man who is set apart from his brothers. You know, I don't look back in regret. I'm just looking forward at this point. I'm going to look at 39 forward, like, excited about getting to know my family and our kids growing up. You know what's so cool is, like, London's six years old. Ten years from now, she's not going to remember not even knowing her cousins. Like, she'll just know her cousins her whole life. I wasn't looking for a father, but he calls me son, and we have great chats. I wasn't looking for the intimate brothers, but we have amazing chats, you know? Like, God has gone exceedingly above and beyond what I could have ever imagined the outcome to be. I wanted to know where I came from. I wanted to know if some other people existed that maybe looked like me. Or, And we laughed so hard the first day we met because our humor, our mannerisms, like everything is so similar. Like we were talking about the difference between nature and nurture, you know, the genetics and stuff. Like we were raised in completely different households in different sides of Canada. And we are so similar. It's creepy. Like we're, the wives were just like, oh my gosh, how is this even possible? Here's the funniest thing. So I'm five foot 10 and my arm span is six foot four which I don't know if you know this, but in a room of 100 people, everybody will be within half an inch of their height. So I've always grown up with monkey arms and this was my thing, okay? This is like my claim to fame. The first time talking to Jay, I just wanna ask you something. Do you by any chance have like longer arms <laughs> than normal? He was laughing so hard because him and Jay, or him and Joe and dad all have, we are all, when I was there visiting, we all are six inches longer than our height. <laughs> all four of us. So when Jay told uh, Ron that, he's like, yep, definitely my son. <laughs> that was before the fraternity test, so that was the joke. The joke to this day is that it didn't matter that we looked alike as soon as they heard that I had monkey arms, because they had grown up with monkey arms. And to be standing here looking back at, you know, the feelings I had way back here, hopelessness like all you know what I mean just this idea that maybe a dad was out there maybe some brothers and sisters to like where I am today it's such a cool story to not share it 
in a way that people can actually take it all in. The hand of God has been upon me for many years. Uh, truly, you know, I look back at what I've walked through. I should have died many times, you know. But here I am, still, still kicking. <laughs> God is good. The end result is God's grace and mercy. Tremendous. Like, who would have thought that it would end so well, really, almost 40 years later? Psalm 136 is a psalm of God's unfailing love. There's 26 verses in it. <clears throat> and the second line of every verse says, His mercy endures forever, or His faithful love endures forever, or His love never quits. His love never quits. You know, through all, His love never quit. I have moved many times on God. I have run from him many times. He has never run from me. He is a faithful God.